Well, good morning. It's a privilege to be here with you this morning. I'm very excited about the opportunity we have to uh, tackle a topic that creates a lot of questions and for many believers is something of a source of discomfort at times as you read through the narratives of the Old Testament, wondering how all this played out, particularly in the book of Joshua and other places. And so I'm looking forward to this opportunity to spend some time together this morning. I want to just take a moment to uh, say, because of the nature of the, the folks that are here today, just to make sure that uh, everyone knows what standpoint I'm coming from. I, of course, am addressing this as a Christian theologian who believes in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, I believe in the supremacy of Scripture, that is to say, the inspiration, inerrancy, and authority of Scripture. Therefore, I believe that the narratives uh, that are related in Joshua and these other books are historical narratives that convey historical truth of what actually took place. And so I sort of need to go over some of those presuppositions just so you know up front that's the standpoint I'm coming from. And so I'll try to be fair and objective as I deal particularly with uh, Islam and Jihad later in the lecture, but I am coming from the standpoint that says that the Christian scriptures are the only source of authority for life. Uh, you may be aware of uh, books that come out from time to time that deal with these issues, and two of them that I've uh, read through again recently, uh, one of them is Show Them No Mercy, Four Views uh, of, on God and Canaanite Genocide. Now, you may have seen this book, or maybe some of you have read this book. Uh, I just want to say, uh, in dealing with books such as this, one caveat is uh, the assumption is given that there are really only four views when it relates to this issue. Uh, in reality, I could say that there are elements of each of the views that I would hold to. So what I'm, in other words, what I'm saying today is uh, I'm presenting uh, a new paradigm that's suggestive of how we should interpret holy war, and it's based upon a dispensational interpretation of Scripture. And I think that what is often uh, passed over in scholarship on this issue today is that the dispensational distinctive of the nation Israel, I think, is the key to unlocking holy war. So as I develop that today, uh, I hope that I will be able to persuade you that that's the case. Another book uh, that I might recommend to you if you're more interested in the uh, Islam and Jihad issue, this just came out last Tuesday. It's called Answering Jihad, A Better Way Forward. It's a popularly written book from a former Muslim who converted to Christianity. Uh, who happens to be from the town where I'm now teaching in Virginia Beach. And uh, he writes a book about a Christian perspective on Islam and Jihad. Uh, his name is Nabil Qureshi. My wife said as I was leaving uh, town just a few days ago, don't be boring. So I will try not to be boring this morning uh, so I can live up to her legacy. She, she's the one that keeps me real, so I appreciate that. So we are looking this morning at Holy War, and I'm glad to be part of the Rice Lecture Series. I've uh, heard of these and have not been able to participate in years past, so I'm glad that we have an opportunity to do this this morning. I want to frame my discussion by looking at a verse of Scripture that I think helps to cast a helpful shadow over this whole issue of Holy War, and that is Deuteronomy 16.20. And the reason that this is such an important verse, I think, is that because it gets to the heartbeat of why this was necessary in the Old Testament. Uh, I'll have a lot of passages of Scripture uh, on the screen as we go to different places. These are generally my translations from the Hebrew text. Uh, so Deuteronomy 16.20 says, Justice, always justice, or above all else, justice, you shall pursue in order that you may live and possess the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Justice was a supreme concern in terms of the people of Israel's relationship to God and to the land. And in that relationship, I think we see a paradigm for how to interpret holy war. I want to begin with a real-life parable uh, in the sense that this actually took place and may be similar to something you've experienced at some point in your life. I was sitting in a coffee shop a few years ago with the son of a missionary. Uh, he had grown up in France, and he had decided over the years as he wrestled with certain questions, particularly with the conquest of Canaan, that he would become an atheist. And so his parents were very concerned about him and asked that he would meet with me and 
uh, discuss some issues related to theodicy and how to work through the existence of evil and all these things. And so we met at a Panera Bread. We had coffee and bagels together, and we began to talk over these issues. And as I listened to him tell his narrative of how he had reached his position, he began to make certain statements such as those I put on the board. I just can't believe in a God who would command his people to kill women and children. This was a particular difficulty for him to understand how God would allow this. He said, I refuse to believe in such a God. He was really at the end of a crisis of faith. He had already decided to become an atheist. He said, how could God allow, let alone command such a thing? Perhaps this is the sort of question you've heard or thought about yourself. And finally, he, he came to the conclusion, I have no need for such a monstrous God. And he left the conversation as he had come, convinced that he couldn't believe in such a God. Perhaps you've had a conversation similar to that uh, recently with the rise of so-called new atheism. There has been an increase in vitriol and attack against the God of scriptures. Perhaps you're familiar with uh, this movement of new atheism. I'm talking in particular about four well-known skeptics of the faith, uh, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, and Daniel Dennett. Of course, there are others as well, but those are uh, primary figures in this. And they've led a new attack against the, the God of scriptures because of, related to, these accusations of genocide and other things. I want to have a quote here from one of the leading lights of this. I was going to put a picture of a monster here, but I settled just for a picture of Richard Dawkins instead. <laughs> Uh, he does look pretty gruff and grim there. Uh, this is one of the most famous uh, quotations, and it sort of sums up the vitriol uh, and I think really the lack of sincere argumentation on the side of those who call themselves the new atheists. He says this, The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Uh, this comes from Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. Now, we may be tempted to uh, sort of dismiss such straw man argumentation as really just more heat than light. But these accusations, at the very least, do hint at some of the more challenging questions which emerge from the pages of the Old Testament. Particularly, these questions relate to how can we reconcile theological enunciations of the gracious and loving character of God, such passages as Exodus 34, 6, which says, The Lord, the Lord, a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in loyal love and faithfulness, to reconcile that with the recurring reports of carnage in the conquest accounts purportedly undertaken at God's behest. How a benevolent, merciful God could enjoin what appears to be wholesale annihilation of Canaanite populations. How justice or necessity would lead to God commanding the Israelites to not keep alive anything that breathes, Deuteronomy 20, 16, to devote them to, to destruction, or as I would translate this, to consign them to eradication, Deuteronomy 7 and Deuteronomy 20, and to show no mercy or no kindness to them, Deuteronomy 7, 2. Is Walter Wink right to assert that in the face of such a cruel God as the Old Testament displays, the revolt of atheism is an act of pure religion? In a similar vein, with the rise of religiously motivated terrorism in the West, we've seen an increase in questions related particularly to how the conquest of Canaan relates to Islamic Jihad against civilian populaces. The question is often asked whether the conquest narratives of the Old Testament, the medieval crusades, and Islamic Jihad do not prove that the three major monotheistic religions are really simply religions of reprehensible violence. Now, whether or not we arrive at such extremes, we may agree that the manner in which the Israelites took possession of the land of Canaan, 
poses one of the most difficult interpretative issues in the Old Testament for the contemporary reader of Scripture. As Michael Walzer says, the conquest of Canaan with all its attendant slaughter is the most problematic moment in the history of ancient Israel. So then, in light of this, uh, these are some questions that I just asked. Let me slide it here. How should the Christian respond? What should be our response in the face of these sorts of questions uh, when we're seeking to defend the faith or understand Scripture? I would suggest that an appropriate place to begin is by constructing what I would call a biblical theology of holy war. Now, I'm presupposing that uh, many of you understand the difference when I say a biblical theology, uh, that I'm looking at how the theme traces itself through the contours of Scripture in more of a linear fashion. So, in other words, how does Scripture speak of holy war canonically from the beginning to the end? And understanding how it traces holy war, I think, will help us to have better answers when we approach these sorts of questions. Now, when we begin to frame this, however, we soon realize that there are a lot of complex issues that don't easily resolve themselves. Uh, I've found this as I tackled the material myself, just when I thought maybe I had a solution, then I would uncover another question that would lead to more wondering as to what, how to solve this, how to answer these questions, because we have many issues we have to deal with. For instance, the character and sovereignty of God, right? We're dealing with a, a God who is holy and just and righteous, and yet at the same time, uh, good and merciful and compassionate. So how do we reconcile the character and sovereignty of God with this? We're also dealing with the depravity of mankind. Uh, what often is missed by the skeptics as they discuss this dismissed out of hand is the fact that the Bible stresses repeatedly the depravity of the Canaanites and the connection between their sin and God's justice. So we have to incorporate that. We, look, we have to look also at the obligations of covenant blessing and curse. I'll make the case that what we see in holy war is really an amplification of God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, I will bless the nations that bless you, I will curse those who curse you. And so we see that played out in the narratives, particularly of Joshua. We also have to think about the establishment and preservation of national Israel as a distinct entity. So how is Israel to be preserved in the Old Testament, looking forward to the coming Messiah? And in the New Testament uh, through Christ, and then in the eschatological uh, domain at the end of the age, how God again will deal redemptively with the nation of Israel. And I think this is a key element in constructing this biblical theology. There's also the idea of consecration of promised land. And this will be the main point of difference, particularly between Islamic Jihad and uh, Holy War in the Old Testament, or Yahweh War, as I'll say, and that is the consecration of land. God had designated the land of Canaan as the place for his name to dwell, as Deuteronomy repeatedly says. And so in light of that, he had consecrated this land and was to bequeath it in accordance with his promises and character to the nation of Israel. And again, there is a divine intention to bless all families of the earth. Um, I, I think I could go so far as to say our salvation is dependent on holy war happening in the Old Testament. It was necessary to preserve the nation Israel so that Messiah could come, so that the blessing of Abraham could reach every nation. And so holy war is integrally connected to all of these things. So I will this morning uh, sketch a theology of holy war in the Old Testament with particular emphasis in dispensational interpretive terms upon the uniqueness of Israel. I will suggest that holy war specifically is related to establishing and preserving the nation Israel as a distinct entity and that understanding it in this fashion is really, I think, the interpretive key to understand what's going on. Uh, it's connected to the origin and destiny of Israel, and these connections allow the theologian and interpreter to develop a theology of divine warfare that best accounts for all of these difficult passages in Joshua and other places. Okay, so that's uh, my goal. Let me give a quick overview of where I'll touch on. And I'll just say this at the outset that uh, the lion's share of my material is in the first two segments of the three sessions today. That is to say, looking at what holy war was in the Old Testament, uh, 
and looking at contemporary issues related to holy war, particularly accusations of genocide and connections to Islamic Jihad. For the third session, I'm really proposing a rubric for reading the New Testament without exhaustively going into detailed exegesis of texts. I'm merely suggesting that if we understand holy war, as I'm proposing that I think the scriptures teach, it gives us a helpful framework to understand when we read violent passages in the book of Revelation in particular, to connect this back to holy war makes sense because God is again redemptively dealing with the nation Israel in the eschaton after the rapture of the church. All right, so with that in mind, these are a few of the, the key things we'll look at. Number one, past aspects of holy war. I'm going to make the argument that holy war begins, originates in the Exodus event. That is to say, when God constitutes the nation Israel by redeeming them from Egypt and giving them law on Sinai, that this is the integral event that casts a paradigm for holy war in the Old Testament. And here we see God as divine warrior and related to his theme as divine warrior, such roles as redeemer, judge, father, and king. And so in the Exodus event, we have really the origin of holy war. Exodus is the archetype for the divine warrior. And so in the Exodus, uh, God reveals himself in this way. We'll also look at proper terminology for holy war in the Old Testament. I'll make the case that holy war really should be called Yahweh war. Now that may be unfamiliar terminology to many of you. Uh, Yahweh is a customary way in Old Testament scholarship to uh, talk about what in older versions may have uh, the name of God as Jehovah. Uh, Yahweh is a name for the Lord. In many of English versions today, it will simply be the Lord in all caps. So I'll make the case that Yahweh war is probably the best way because it's in keeping with the idiom of Scripture. In other words, this is what the Bible itself calls it. So that's, I think, the best way to, to term it as well. And then I'll look at classifications and patterns of warfare. Uh, at that point, I'll, I'll give a handout and look at four distinct categories of Old Testament war. This is a paradigm that I've created, I think, uh, covers mo most of the bases as to how we should understand warfare in the Old Testament. And I'll give a definition of Yahweh war. All right, I will then look at present aspects and first begin by looking at charges of genocide. Uh, many of the skeptics of Scripture say that genocide occurs in the Old Testament. And it's not just skeptics. Uh, if you read this book on the four views, uh, even Eugene Merrill, who is closest to my own view, says that this is genocide. I'm going to make the case that it's not genocide and hopefully persuade you that uh, as the skeptics define genocide, we don't see genocide in the Old Testament. Uh, but what we do have to look at is this biblical practice of harem. And this is where I'll spend a lot of time. When, when people say, and, and this is where some confusion comes about, even I think in this book, they tend to overlap categories. So let me try to explain this. They say, Yahweh war is genocide. Well, I'll make the case that Yahweh war is entirely a different concept. It's when God delivers his people through military means. When they talk about genocide, what they really need to be addressing is this issue of harem. And what, this is a Hebrew word, it's a Semitic word, which really means to devote something to destruction. So if you read through Joshua, you'll see, for instance, in Jericho, everything is devoted to destruction. Nothing is left alive. So if there is genocide, that's when it's happening. That's when it's taking place. Yahweh war itself is not, in my mind, to be identified with harem, which is a specific aspect of Yahweh war. So I'll argue for a distinction there. And I'll make the case that harem uh, is what is necessary to uh, God's right to the land, Israel's establishment in the land, proper worship of God, purity in the habitations, because the Canaanites had polluted the land. If you read through Leviticus carefully, you'll see that often God makes the statement that you must not do what the Canaanites do because the land is vomiting them out. As if the land really has an integral role here in the preservation of a balance that only God's people can uh, create. And so the land itself needs to be purified. This eradicates pollution caused by idolatry, which seems to be a particularly heinous sin. I would argue because idolatry is connected to demonic influences, particularly in Deuteronomy 32, uh, where idols are equated to demons. Uh, Leviticus 17 also talks about this. They worship goat demons. Uh, and so harem needs to eradicate that pollution that's caused by idolatry and sexual perversion. Uh, and I'll make the case that it, in modern terms, if any Western nation condoned such crimes as the Canaanites committed, 
Almost every nation of the West, even today, would rise up and say, this is unjust. And so we'll look at that and see why that's the case. And then I think also this foreshadows eschatological preparation for the land, for uh, regenerate Israel in the kingdom. In other words, I'll suggest that we should read passages which address fire as purification as an eschatological harem, particularly in 2 Peter 3 and in other places. That is to say, God preparing the land again for Israel for kingdom purposes. And I think that that's uh, a helpful way of understanding what's going on. So we'll look at that. Uh, we'll also look at present aspects of holy war and jihad. Uh, I'll save some of this for then. Uh, so just know I have several, uh, several statements here that I'll uh, look at to try to explain how Yahweh war differs from jihad. And then we'll look at uh, why Yahweh war was necessary. This is where I'll try to make a little foray into just war principles. Uh, I've taught this, some of this material down in Virginia Beach to a room full of veterans and acti active duty servicemen. And it was a very interesting conversation, but I think you can relate Yahweh war to just war principles, although it's somewhat anachronistic to do that. In other words, you're, you're looking at something that was formulated in the 15th and 16th century about how war should be conducted. But I think we can use it as a rubric for understanding Yahweh war to see that justice was at work even then. So we'll look at how it's essential to bring God's plan for Abrahamic blessing to all nations underscores God's sovereignty. It's necessary for preserve, uh, preserving Israel. It's crucial to the institution of sanctioned worship, consistent with just war principles, and it's functional as a paradigm for eschatological Yahweh war. And then finally, looking at future aspects of holy war. And I'll argue that the New Testament casts Yahweh war in uh, spiritual terms and its true spiritual primacy as a conflict against false gods. What I think needs to be understood is all Yahweh war is first and foremost a battle against false gods. This is evident in the Exodus event. For instance, in Exodus 12, 12, the Lord says that I pronounce judgment on Egypt's gods. And so it's against a spiritual force. And in the New Testament, Christ has triumphed over hostile spiritual powers. That is to say, through his uh, cross work, he has triumphed through his resurrection. He has pr proclaimed victory over these demonic spiritual forces. And so the believer takes a defensive posture, a la Ephesians 6 and other places, against these spiritual forces antagonistic to the church and to God's work on earth. And then finally, looking at Yahweh war and the eschaton, and I'll argue that Yahweh war is paradigmatic for eschatological battles. So what I mean by that is when the Lord returns to save Israel from her foes, that the best way to interpret these passages is through the lens of Yahweh war. And this is where many interpretations get off the tracks uh, because they fail to recognize that the end of the Bible is just as violent as some of the parts of the beginning of the Bible. That is to say, you're not off the hook by just saying Jesus pronounces love because if you really believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, the Jesus who comes back in Revelation 19 is a, is a ferocious figure producing terror. And so I think Yahweh war helps us to understand Christ in all of his uh, beauty in Scripture and all of the facets of his character. So it's paradigmatic for that. And I'll also suggest that the bowl and trumpet judgments in Revelation are analogous to the plagues in Egypt, which are an undoing of creation through judgment. That is to say, the boundaries of creation are loosed. And so this takes place in Revelation as God judges the earth in order to, again, uh, redeem Israel from her enemies and foes who are seeking to obliterate her. All right, so that's uh, what we will cover. So we begin this morning with looking at past implications of holy war in the Old Testament, how it particularly is developed. The first place that the Lord is revealed as a divine warrior or as a man of war is in Exodus 15.3. And you may, uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, follow along in some things as we read. We'll be looking at different passages from time to time. In Exodus 15.3, uh, the people of Israel have been redeemed from their Egyptian enemies. The Lord has given them a triumph uh, and they are singing a song rejoicing in the Lord. And this is where God, the Lord, is first identified as a man of war, a divine 
warrior. And so we see in, in many ways the Exodus functions as a supreme paradigmatic redemptive event of the Old Testament. Paul House writes that probably no event in Israel's history rivals the Exodus for its theological importance. It was the key redemptive event. Millard Lind writes that the Exodus is referred to in every stratum of the Pentateuch, in the prophetic books, in the writings. The victory was foundational for the Israelite community as the people of Yahweh. It was the sign of Yahweh's steadfast love. It was the basis for confidence in his future saving acts. It was the ground for Yahweh's demand for faithfulness to him and his law and was united by the prophets with the concept of the chosen people. So these two concepts of salvation and judgment undergirded God's deliverance of his people and served as the basis for redemption throughout the Old Testament. As Longman and Reed write, this poem represents the first explicit statement of the warlike nature of God. The Exodus event itself became an important archetype in the biblical tradition, a means of telling and retelling God's acts of deliverance. Uh, Dozeman, uh, who has also written a monograph on this topic of uh, God in the Exodus event, uh, he writes that the destruction of the Egyptian army is the primary story of salvation for Israel. And central to it is the portrait of God in combat. The destruction of the Egyptians is a story of holy war. Now, why is this important? Let me just say it this way, that if the Exodus event is the archetype and paradigm for holy war, that means we don't start with Joshua. In other words, we're not starting necessarily with the conquest of Canaan and understanding what Yahweh war is. We're starting with the Exodus event. And that becomes important because Yahweh war then is cast in soteriological terms as an act of redemption and deliverance. Now, I'll make the case that there are different types of Yahweh war. I'll say that the Exodus event, in my mind, is the, uh, the chief supreme pattern, but there is also what I would call a, a more synergistic Yahweh war. And at times, this reflects some of the ambiguity of the narratives where sometimes it appears that vengeful aims are in view rather than simply deliverance or liberation. So we'll address that when we come to it. But I would make the case that the Exodus event gives us a paradigm for holy war because it's related to how God delivers his people from the life-threatening imperilment of bondage and oppression that is imposed by forces, spiritual forces first and foremost, and then physical forces that are opposed to God's creational order his intention to bless all peoples. And so therefore it's necessary to understand it through these terms that it's primarily redemptive in nature and God is saving his people uh, because I, I think this gives us a, a helpful rubric. Let me just say that understood this way, it's an interesting phenomenon of scripture that I think the first and last instances of Yahweh war in the Old Testament in the nation of Israel both fit the pattern of the Exodus. That is to say, it's the Exodus event, Exodus really 1 to 15, and then Hezekiah's deliverance from Sennacherib. And in both cases, Israel is largely passive. In fact, the language is repeated to stand still, see what the Lord will do. And in, those, in that case, that is the paradigm for Yahweh war. It's the Lord actively saving his people, the people largely passive, and, and therefore God is the divine warrior to redeem his people. So, uh, given this fundamental nature of the Exodus shaping Israel's holy war ideology, I want to just take some time to understand how warfare was conducted in the ancient world. The reason this is important is to understand that Israel both echoes some practices of warfare in the, old, in the ancient Near East, but also has some strong distinctions and how they practice warfare. Understanding this will help us to see that when Israel does holy war, they're not simply copying what other nations are doing. They have distinct differences in how they employ it that speak to the Lord's sovereignty. But it's helpful to set the context. So let me uh, just give you a few things. I apologize if the print is uh, small. I, I can't help it. I'm, I just I write a lot. So I'm always criticized that I put too much material up there. If you need... Uh, to take notes afterwards, we can arrange for you to get this. All right, so how was uh, war conducted in the ancient Near East? Let me just give you a few key things that would often happen. 
When we talk about divine warfare, we're not saying Israel is the only nation that believed in divine warfare. In fact, every nation of the ancient Near East uh, had some form of this. Even going back to the 25th century BC, the first inscription uh, of a war account says that the war is conducted at the behest of the gods for a boundary treaty violation. So divine warfare was not unique to Israel. But as I said, there were distinctives we'll talk about in a moment. So when nations of the ancient Near East went to fight, what did they do? First, they would be given a decree from the God to go and fight. And it was usually received through prayer or by visiting the God's shrine. It was viewed as a divine mission in which the king executed judgment, attained prestige, or reclaimed or expanded kingdom territory. In other words, the God was sending the king on a mission, and the war was fought as a mission uh, for those purposes. Number two, div- divination priests consulted the God through omens to determine the God's will for battle timing and strategy. That is to say, uh, they would look for omens as to how they would conduct the battle. Uh, we do see this sometimes in Scripture, right? When David hears the sound of marching in the balsam trees, the Lord is indicating here strategy and timing. Uh, sometimes there would be execration rites, if you've heard of this terminology, that is to say, uh, Pots and figurines would be smashed as personifying how the enemy would be destroyed or archery would be undertaken. Number three, the god would be a divine warrior coming to battle with the king's adversaries. And usually he was on the battlefield through banners or totems or other things. And he would often uh, be seen as manipulating natural disasters such as thunderstorms or floods to give victory to the people. Once victory was achieved, uh, the divine warrior was... Uh, exalted, and the spoils of war were given to uh, the the god, usually to build the god's abode. So one of the key elements after divine warfare was conducted was a palace abode for the god was constructed, and the god would take up residence in that palace temple complex. This was the culmination of that. It's interesting that uh, there are, I think, some echoes of this even in the book of Exodus, for instance, right? When Exodus 25 to 40 deals at length with the tabernacle and what seems to modern readers is a lot of tedium really is a a, uh, deep concern for explaining how God's royal residence, that is the tabernacle, is to be constructed. They were very fastidious about the details because it was important. That's why I love tabernacle passages, much to the chagrin of my family, for instance. Uh, Number five, post-battle cultic observance honored the gods with rites of sacrifice and thanksgiving. Uh, and they would celebrate in order to thank the God. Now, uh, why is it necessary to go over this? This doesn't really deal with the Bible. Well, let me uh, try to explain why when Israel does it, it has some unique components that ought to make us say, okay, something different is going on here. This is what is often lost to us because we're so culturally removed from the millennia past of the ancient Near East that when Israel does something uh, in the ancient context, that would have been a remarkable distinction. All right, well, what are these? Number one, the prophet replaces the king as the primary leader and mediator of divine deliverance. In other words, it's not the king receiving a divine mission. It's the prophet who's the spokesman for God coming and saying this is what must take place. And let me just suggest if you, with this understanding, if you go back and read through many of the holy war or Yahweh war accounts in the Old Testament, I think you'll be Surprised to find how often this does fit the pattern that a prophet comes and relates. For instance, before Gideon, uh, we'll read another passage in, in a little while um, from Second Chronicles 20 of uh, Jehoshaphat. And I think uh, we see the same thing happening there. So this is a paradigm of prophet comes. And th- what does this do? Number one, this protects Yahweh's sovereignty. He's not sharing his glory with an earthly king who's producing victory. It protects his sovereignty. And then it focuses on the revelatory word. In other words, the word is necessary as the medium for encountering divine warfare. It's not simply just that the king wants glory and therefore conducts war, but the prophet is saying, this is what God wants us to do. Hosea says this in Hosea 12, 13. He says, by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel up from Egypt and by a prophet, he was kept. So Moses, the prophet was the leader. And although he had some regal Uh, overlap in terms of how he's cast as a character, Uh, he's primarily a prophet. Secondly, divine compassion served as the principal motivating factor for the Exodus. Uh, 
This is unique in the ancient Near Eastern world. That is to say that God responds to his people's cry for help and deliverance. And this is typically a pattern, particularly uh, if you look at uh, passages such as Exodus 2. In fact, let's turn there and just read that. Exodus 2, 23 to 25. God is not undertaking divine war simply so that he can uh, exalt himself over the Egyptians. Of course, that is an important component of it, but he's responding to the people's cries. Uh, In verse 23, during those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew What's interesting about this is uh, it uses three words to describe the people's groans and four words to describe God's response. That is to say the people have groans, is the Hebrew word anah, they have cries for help, za'ak, they have cries for deliverance, shav'ah, and God responds, shema, by hearing, zakar, by remembering, ra'ah, by seeing, and yada, by understanding or knowing. All this suggests that God is Uh, sufficient to the task that he's responding to the people's cry for deliverance, and this is how he will deliver them. And so an important component of Yahweh war is this. Uh, Third, divine revelation places the emphasis on the miraculous power of Yahweh and the intrinsic passivity of God's people. That is to say, in the epical event of the Exodus, it's the Lord who takes charge as the divine warrior. He leads the people into battle. Moses says this in Exodus 14, 14, during the delivery at the Red Sea, he says, the Lord will wage war on your behalf, but you shall remain still. Uh, Some versions render this, you shall uh, stand still or be quiet. The point is the Lord is doing this. He's accomplishing this war on your behalf. Uh, Millard Lynn, for instance, says, Yahweh as a God of war fought for his people by miracle, not by sword and spear. And uh, John Wood says the decisive element in this was the conviction that Yahweh achieves the victory. The human participants simply receive help. And then finally, Yahweh's singular role as divine warrior created a distinctive theocratic dominion with Yahweh's exclusive prerogative to reign as redeemer, judge, father, and king over his people. In other words, this wasn't followed by a coronation ceremony where Moses is crowned as king. Who is called king in the celebration afterwards? It's the Lord. The Lord is. And so uh, Yahweh himself is the one who receives the glory. Uh, One other point, I think I passed over the fourth one there. Yahweh achieves victory to demonstrate his unrivaled power and transcendent superiority over all other gods. That is to say, again, when he fights the battle, it's to achieve victory over the gods. In Exodus 15.11, They say, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods, who is like you, glorious in holiness, reverenced in praises, working wonders. So this is an important component because when Yahweh fights the war, he's not simply fighting the human enemies of Israel. That is to say, it's not simply that his people are in a pickle and he must come and help them so much as to say these enemies are the Lord's enemies. And when the Lord achieves victory, he's achieving victory triumphant supremacy over the false gods. And then finally, he becomes himself the king. Uh, In Exodus 14.4, he tells Moses, I will glorify myself over Pharaoh and over all his army so that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And in the victory song, the Israelites celebrate. They say, your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, smashes the enemy. And in verse 18, the Lord will reign forever and ever. So these are all key elements of distinction. All right, so how then does the Exodus event serve as a pattern for holy war? Let me uh, point out the, how these distinctions that I just mentioned, in fact, give us a paradigm quickly for how this is to take place. Number one, God's people groan or mourn due to oppression or peril. You'll often find this uh, as you read through accounts of the narratives of the Old Testament that it begins by the people realizing they need the Lord's deliverance. We particularly see this, of course, right in the book of Judges where the cycle repeats itself, where they fall into sin or bondage 
and they groan or mourn due to oppression or peril. God hears his people's cry. We read Exodus 2, 23 to 25, and he raises up a prophet signaling God's decisive act of salvation is at hand. It's coming. The false gods of the enemy are defeated by signs and wonders. In the case of the Exodus, we have uh, what seems to be a contest, but it really just proves the superiority of Yahweh and his power over the Egyptian gods, the false gods. God's enemies become hardened in heart and antagonistic toward God's purposes. Uh, if you're a graduate of Detroit Seminary, you probably don't need me to go at length into the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. It's usually covered in many of the classes. Uh, but the enemies become hardened in heart. They become antagonistic toward God's purposes. And this results in judgment to God's glory. The enemies are filled with panic. That is to say, they're fearful, realizing that God is supreme and they're put to death. God is the divine warrior, fights on behalf of his people, delivers them through a splendid, often unexpected victory. And then God is glorified over his enemies and worshiped by his people in the ensuing celebration of victory. So this is the pattern for Israel. And as I said, it's distinct from the ancient Near East because the Lord himself takes an active role and he is the king. He leads the people. He saves the people. He responds in compassion. So what does this tell us? This tells us that God does not conduct Yahweh war simply because he's angry, but he wants to save and deliver his people. He's compassionate. He's gracious. This is the distinction often lost in modern discussions when you jump right into the book of Joshua is failing to realize that ultimately this begins because the Lord has compassion for his people. He wants to save his people from bondage and oppression. And so it's important to see that connection to what's going on. All right, so moving from here, I want to talk about now the, uh, the nomenclature or the terminology of warfare in the Old Testament. Why do we talk about holy war? Uh, if anything, this is a term that is probably a difficult one to sustain when you're having conversations because it does cast the Old Testament in an unfavorable light. Well, holy war began to be applied to the Old Testament really at the beginning of the 20th century. And it was due to a monograph written by a German scholar named Friedrich Schwale. And Schwale said uh, that when he was discussing holy war in the Old Testament or warfare in the Old Testament, he took the Arabic word jihad and allegedly he coined this phrase holy war on the basis of jihad in a way to describe the Old Testament warfare. The actual title of his book uses the terminology Heiliger Krieg. If you know German, that's the idea of holy war, uh, salvation war. And so he coined this terminology. And then Gerhard von Rad, who was an influential German scholar in the mid 20th century, he wrote a book in 1951 and again used this word holy war. And that became the classic treatment of holy war and it's still often referenced today in all of the literature, really, on holy war. Really, however, uh, this was a misnomer because holy war never really was a good way to describe what was going on. Because it wasn't warfare that was holy in the way that the terminology itself suggests. If anything, perhaps it would have been better to say sacred warfare. Uh, but the idea of sacred warfare and holy war really originates also in the ancient Near East. We already looked at the, uh, the notion of divine warfare in the ancient Near East. As I mentioned, as early as the third millennium BC, Mesopotamian kings claimed to practice divine warfare, and this was found in the cultures of Ugarit, Mari, Anatolia, Mesopotamia, Egypt, Assyria, and Arabia, among others. So how did it come to the West? Uh, Chapman and some others argue that Holy War terminology entered the West through the ancient Greeks. That is, the Greeks were concerned about conducting warfare connected to the cult. Uh, if you were raised in a certain era, perhaps you read Homer when you were younger and, and uh, remember those connections between warfare and the cult. And Groff demonstrates that the roots of Holy War terminology in Christian Europe really go back to the 12th century. There was a writer by the name of uh, Guibert of no Jen, and he wrote a history of the First Crusade entitled The Deeds of God Through the Franks, and he used the terminology of holy war. It entered English vernacular through John Bunyan's spiritual allegory, The Holy War, which was published in 1682. 
Now in contemporary scholarship, following the lead of Rudolf Schmend and some others, the nomenclature has shifted toward describing it as the Old Testament itself describes it. That is to say, how does the Old Testament describe this phenomenon? Consistently, it says that the battles fought by the Lord belong to or are characterized by Yahweh. So for instance, in Exodus 17, 16, it says the battle belongs to the Lord or to Yahweh. Or the reference is made to the battles, plural, of Yahweh in places such as 1 Samuel 18 or 25. And in the Torah, there's a reference to the book of the wars of Yahweh in Numbers 21, 14. It's unclear what this was. Some speculate it was an epic poem or anthology of poems that narrated or rehearsed the battles of Israel's early history. The Lord himself is designated as a man of war during the Exodus event, as we saw. And this foreshadows his role in the eschaton. For instance, in Isaiah 42, 13, again, he's called a man of war, looking forward to prophetic end of times when, again, the Lord will be a, a warrior, a divine warrior. Opposing combatants are denominated as Yahweh's enemies. And uh, in various contexts, the word holy is used uh, to describe aspects of combat. For instance, Israelite soldiers were said to be consecrated. This is, if, if you're familiar with Hebrew, the D stem or PL, they were uh, to be made holy for battle, consecrated. The spoils could also be consecrated. And prophets commanded to consecrate the battle. Now, there's some question about what this means. Uh, I would take this probably as an accusative of specification or limitation. What I mean by this is that the troops were told to sanctify themselves for or in respect to the battle. That is to say, they were to themselves to be consecrated. Uh, it could be that this is simply a declaration of war to consecrate the battle. And then the military camp was to be kept holy due to Yahweh's presence. So, for instance, uh, in Deuteronomy 23, 14, it says, When you go to war, your camp must be holy because the Lord himself walks about in your camp. And this terminology of walking about is usually used of the tabernacle or temple to denote the Lord's presence. He is present with his people in the camp. Therefore, they must be holy or clean. So Yahweh war in the language and context of the Old Testament signifies battle engagements in which the Lord takes initiative. He opposes his enemies. He delivers victory. Sometimes he does so in tandem with his consecrated warriors. In that Yahweh himself is taking charge and initiative in the conflict as the divine warrior, I would argue or suggest that it's preferable to designate these wars as Yahweh wars, as wars that belong to the Lord. So we talk about uh, divine warfare or Yahweh war. That's really what we mean, battles that belong to the Lord himself. All right, now the last uh, part here, uh, and, and we'll... Uh, just introduce this, and we'll take a break in a moment, and then I'll resume when we come back. And that is the classification and patterns of warfare in the Old Testament. Uh, when we look at wars in the Old Testament, is every war Yahweh war? Or is there a distinction between normal, quote-unquote, wars, ordinary warfare, and Yahweh war? Well, various scholars have suggested different things. For instance, Derek Kidner said there are three types of wars in the Old Testament. There are wars of aggression, wars of liberation or defense, and wars of divine judgment. He's using here the typical categories of aggression and defense as nomenclature for war. In other words, in modern terminology, we would often say a war is either a de uh, defensive or aggressive. And usually the aggressor in just war principle thinking uh, is to be punished for uh, being aggressive toward another nation. But I would argue that in the scriptures and in the ancient Near East, the line between aggressive and defensive was often a little more blurry than we would suggest today in modern terms. And that is to say, uh, for instance, one scholar ha has studied warfare in Assyria, and he said, by Assyrian standards, every time the king declared war, it was defensive. And the reason is because Assyria asserted uh, supremacy or hegemony over all the world. So anytime the Assyrian king went to war, he was defending the name of Assyria. And I think that's probably closer to how war was perceived in the Old Testament than in modern terms of defensive versus aggressive. Now, having said that, I will uh, admit and concede that I think most 
Yahweh wars in the Old Testament are defensive in nature. Gerhard von Rad said that all Yahweh wars are defensive. I don't think you can say that because the conquest of Canaan to me is not a defensive war in, in the way that he maybe is, is thinking. And he's got other interpretive issues that tie into his view that I won't go into. All right, so Kidner says uh, there are three types. The first type was David, for instance, when he raided the tribes from Ziklag. You remember uh, perhaps those stories. He's taking aggressive uh, means to subdue other peoples. Uh, there were wars of defense or liberation. For instance, Numbers 10, 9 says, when you need the Lord to deliver you, cry out and he will save you. And then there are wars of divine judgment, such as the wars against Amalek or against Midian. Now, I would say the problem with this view is the categorization is too broad and it fails to fit Yahweh war sufficiently into the paradigm. So, for instance, the conquest of Canaan falls somewhere between a war of aggression and a war of judgment. Or the exodus falls between a war of liberation and a war of divine judgment. There may also be uh, wars of aggression that are also wars of divine judgment. That is to say, when the Israelites... Uh, after the failed spy debacle, Numbers 13 and 14 decide they're just in their own strength going to go and attack the Am Amalekites and Canaanites, and they're soundly defeated. And so I would classify that both as an, a war of aggression and a war of judgment because God is judging his people through that conflict. All right, well, so then John Wood said, no, it's better to say there are four types of wars, and he uses this defensive and uh, aggressive nomenclature to distinguish them. He says there are defensive wars against aggressors, aggressive wars under Yahweh's approval, aggressive wars waged presumptuously, and wars of divine judgment against Israel. Now, I think this is closer to the mark, but again, this paradigm suffers from too much orientation on the wars as either aggressive or defensive. I don't think that they necessarily would have used those categories in the same way as we might think. And uh, it fails to fit Yahweh war sufficiently into the paradigm. I already mentioned this idea of Assyria. And Assyria thought all wars were defensive because they must protect national interests at all costs. Whether it's a conflict against hawkish adversaries quashing an uprising or reclaiming territories to which the nation claims eminent domain, all wars were defensive for them. So with this understanding, I propose that uh, Old Testament warfare is best collocated by means of a fourfold paradigm. And let me, I'll just end this session with a handout that I have. Uh, so has that already, okay, you guys. Have, uh, this is wars of a fourfold category. And I'll show this and just make some comments and then we'll pause, we'll come back and we'll resume this. Uh, I would say that there are four basic types of warfare in the Old Testament, three of which I would classify as Yahweh war. There are wars of liberation and deliverance. This is archetypal uh, Yahweh war in which Yahweh is active and Israel is passive. There are wars of deliverance, conquest, and expansion. This is a more synergistic Yahweh war with Yahweh providing victory and Israel participating. But sometimes this mixes in questionable human elements. I think a good example of this is Gideon. When Gideon first achieves victory, it's principally through the Lord delivering him from the Midianites. But if you keep reading the narrative, Gideon soon uh, begins to take a more vengeful orientation and wanting to slaughter and express his supremacy. And he ends in idolatry with crafting his own ephod to uh, talk to the Lord. And so we see in Gideon, I think, a downward spiral that is characteristic of each of the judges. Uh, we also maybe could put in David and Uzziah. This, is, this comes into a hermeneutical question because sometimes when you're reading narratives of the Old Testament, you're not quite sure if the narrator is condoning or allowing how we're supposed to view what's taking place. We don't always get explicit clues, so we have to read these very carefully to see what's going on and what the narrator is trying to show us. We also see wars of expansion or political vengeance. These are wars that I would say uh, are more of the conventional warfare of Israel. For instance, when the northern and southern kingdom divided into two kingdoms, the narrative says, for instance, in 1 Kings 14, 19, verse 30, 15, 6, and 7, and verse 16, that the kings of the northern and southern kingdoms were at war their entire reign. That is to say, a sort of civil war between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. 
We're not told that the Lord is involved in this. Really, Yahweh seems to take a more passive or permissive role, and the king or another political leader takes the initiative. This is the one category that I would classify as non Yahweh war in the sense that the Lord is permitting or is a more passive participant and allowing it. Now, some might object and say, well, wouldn't the Israelites have seen all wars as Yahweh wars? That may be the case, but I'm trying to take the orientation of Scripture itself to see where the Lord is active versus where the Lord takes a more permissive role in allowing such wars to take place. And then finally, we see wars of judgment. I would categorize this as inverse Yahweh war. In other words, God is now waging war on Israel herself to punish her for covenant disobedience. So I think this is how we should see Shalmaneser's conquest of the northern capital of Samaria, Nebuchadnezzar's conquest of Judah, Philistia's victory over Israel at Shiloh in 1 Samuel 4. This is God uh, waging war on the behalf of Israel's enemies to punish Israel. All right, so uh, that's my, my paradigm. And I'll just say also that no paradigm is airtight, right? So there are always some overlap and, and don't, uh, equate this with inerrancy by any means, but this is simply a, an attempt to provide a rubric for understanding how wars in the Old Testament seem to take place. And that is within a fourfold paradigm that's not primarily looking at aggressive or defensive postures, although that's part of it, but really more looking at what's the Lord's role? Is the Lord active or passive? Are the people active or passive? And so I think this helps us to categorize how these wars took place.